Good afternoon. Uh, my name is David Forsyth. Thank you for um, hanging in there till the last session. I know it's getting late in the day. It's been a really exciting day. Lots of uh, really interesting uh, uh, things to hear about. Um, I'm going to talk uh, about Eclair.js. I'm going to give you uh, a, an introduction to Eclair.js. Yes, as uh, Denny was about the third person today, you'd asked me how, where the name came from. And yes, I, um, there's this spark French connection, but I also was hungry at the time. I think I thought of it, and I do like chocolate. So it, it seemed entirely appropriate. And you have to put JS at the end. Um, so actually, before I start, um, I'm curious, how many people here would consider themselves to be a web developer who uses Node.js, Express, um, those sorts of technologies. Okay, so a relatively small number, and I guess the rest of you are um, more Spark developers. Is that is that true? I see a few shake nodding heads, a few thumbs up. Okay, all right. Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, Eclair.js, um, which is uh, which is to do with Node.js and Spark. So. Um, in, in, the, in the world that we see, um, businesses are increasingly looking to um, you know, connect more with their customers. They're looking to capture what Forrester calls uh, perishable insights. That's uh, applying analytics to data that is relatively transient. Right? Somebody's got their eyes on a web screen. Uh, the time that they're spending looking at a web page, that, the time that you can act on that information is relatively short. Um, businesses are looking to make use of new data sources, such as that perishable sort of data, streaming data. They're looking to do a lot more analytics and bring data into their, their business applications and make use of it. So today, um, a lot of those uh, front-facing, a lot of those user-facing applications are built uh, using uh, JavaScript-based technologies. So those would be things like Node.js, um, they would be Express, etc. And it's, uh, it's an interesting, Node.js in particular is, is, is an interesting ecosystem. Um, and there are a number of factors that explain why Node.js is so popular. Um, one is that the, uh, the NPM repository, uh, which is the uh, Node.js uh, package management repository, uh, is by some counts, um, module counts for example, is reckoned to be the largest uh, repository of open source packages of any open source project. So there's a huge amount of, um, of packages, of modules available to the Node.js developer for building applications. Um, from a more technical side, what makes uh, Node.js interesting is that it's it's an incredibly efficient at uh, handling multiple simultaneous requests. So a single Node.js server can probably fairly easily handle 10,000 simultaneous connections. Right? It does this not, be, not by trying to process all of those uh, requests simultaneously, but it's, it's going to hold a, essentially a, a handle onto them, and it's going to go on and then connect uh, to receive the next, uh, the next request. And what it does with those, with those connections is it's, is it's going to um, push any processing of, this, of any significance back to some back-end engine, right? Node is not really designed to do compute-intensive uh, kinds of um, uh, processing. Might, so it might be, traditionally, it might be a database. Um, but of course, since we're all at the Spark conference here, um, what I'm here to tell you about is Eclair.js, which is the way that you can provide Node.js and JavaScript with uh, Spark as the backend engine. Right? And of course, Spark has a lot of the characteristics that uh, these uh, business applications, these web applications, desire. Um, so it's obviously scalable. Uh, it runs on my laptop. It runs on large clusters. Uh, you can handle static data, streaming data. Uh, it has, a, has database Spark SQL type capabilities. It has analytics. And it also has a, a graph uh, capabilities as well. And those are all available to the node programmer within a single context. Right? I don't have to have a graph engine and an ML package and a, and a, and a. Okay. But the fly in the ointment here is that, of course, there's no JavaScript API for Spark. There are 
APIs for in uh, Java and uh, Scala, Python, etc., but not for Eclair.js. I'm sorry, and not, but not for um, JavaScript. So that is kind of the, that's the rationale for Eclair.js. Okay, so I thought it would be good just to look at the kind of application you might build, the sort of application that's very easy to build in, um, uh, with Node. You give me a second here, I'll just uh, switch screens. And if uh, the demo gods allow, well, they do. Um, here is a, uh, an, here's a, a map application. It's showing, um, showing all the airports in the US. Um, and the sort of scenario here is that I am, I'm at the airport, and I'm sure you've probably all been in this situation. And they have just, oh, I need to go out one, excuse me. Um, and they've just canceled my flight. Okay, I'm flying to New York from San Francisco, say, and they've just canceled my flight, and I'm standing in line with the rest of you, right? <laughs> and I have sort of two choices. One is to go up to the counter and try and book a flight, maybe on another airline that's going to go through, say, Chicago, or I maybe there's an option to go through LAX. Okay, which one do I pick? Well, if I knew... Uh, so the characteristics of the flights coming inbound to San Francisco, then um, that would help me maybe make that decision. So what we're doing here is that we maybe we'll, we'll, we'll click on SFO here, and we are streaming in FAA flight data that tells us about the um, it tells us about the, the lateness or the on-time arrivals, and they, it's all plotted on a compass rose. Um, so. In this situation, you would uh, maybe be good to fly out to LAX. It looks like if your flights coming from the south, southeast are pretty much on time. Everything else is, um, as there's a lot of red on that screen, and so those are, are flights that are really, that are delayed. So for a, a node web developer, this is, pretty, this is pretty easy stuff, right? I've got OpenStreetMap, I've got D3 widgets, um, this is all pretty straightforward. Um, but writing this directly in front of Spark is not necessarily so easy. Okay, so that's the sort of thing that we're trying to enable um, here with, with Eclair.js. Let me close this up and go back to the presentation. Oh, and one thing I should note, you probably, if you're looking carefully, you'll see that these, uh, these uh, radio segments are, um, are clicking over, so they are actually live. Right. So we are, for San Francisco, we are streaming in the data for um, time and, on, um, and delayed flights. In, in case you're worried, this is CAN data, so if you're looking to get a plane tonight from SFO, probably don't need to worry too much, not at least based on what you're seeing on the screen here. Let me go back. Oops, excuse me. Okay. So, sort of behind the covers, what's going on? Well, this is, this is actually a, a fairly simple application. I've got flight data coming in from FAA. Right? It's coming in through Kafka. As I said, it was CAN, but we could just uh, change the URL. Uh, so instead of pointing to the file system, it could actually um, point out to uh, the FAA. Uh, we're reading the data in in a Spark stream. Uh, we're using a for each RDD, and we're uh, storing the data into uh, uh, Spark SQL temp table, right? and that data is continuing to, to flow in. And Node sends our uh, Node takes care of the, the page selection. You know, type in the URL to the, the browser, um, send back the page has JavaScript in it. User makes a selection um, that is a uh, sp that's a SQL query or a Spark SQL query that's executed out of Node down to that temp table, right? And we get data back. And uh, we also open up a WebSocket, uh, which is something that Node is uh, it's very easy to do in Node. It will forward WebSockets for you uh, very easily. It's a, it's a standard mechanism that Node uses for, for streaming data for handling that connection to the browser. And it will send that data up to the, the radial graph that you, that you saw. OK. so. It's a, it's a pretty straightforward uh, application. Um, I, I want to go into a little bit more detail of kind of what this code looks like. 
Okay? Um, I'm not actually going to go into the, this airport application. I'll, I'm actually going to use the, what's become the uh, Spark uh, Hello World kind of application. So that's, the, that's word count. So here is word count not written in Scala, but here is word count written in JavaScript. Okay, so if you, if you copied this code and ran it in JavaScript with a Clare.js um, install, then this would all run. So I just want to go sort of step through it. A lot of it's going to, the, sort of the general mechanism is going to be fairly familiar to you. Um, but uh, I'm going to step through it just to show you some of the, or explain to you some of the, um, uh, the there's some uh, things to point out which are particular to uh, Eclair.js. So uh, we start out by declaring um, Spark. Uh, so we have this require statement, which is a standard kind of way of bringing in modules to, um, to a, a JavaScript program. So we just re require Spark Eclair.js. Uh, we have to create a Spark context. We are running Spark, after all. Um, you will see that the um, operations that are highlighted and, and bolded are all actually Spark operators, but they are all JavaScript operators, right? They, so they map from JavaScript back down into, um, into Spark. Um, so I'm going to create the context. I'm going to um, have a pointer to a file. I've got a var file there. Um, I'm going to create my initial RDD, which is a text file, uh, pointing to that uh, dream text file. And then I get to my first uh, real sort of operation, which is flat map. OK, so this is simply the, the uh, Spark operator that's going to go through the, uh, the, the text in that file. And it's going to split it up by white space and return um, an array of, um, of the, quote, words that it finds there. So one thing to notice about this is the, the argument to flat map. So there's a lambda function there, right? Function with uh, argument sentence. So that's JavaScript. And that's an important thing to note here. This whole program is JavaScript. There's no distinction here, really, between, oh, this part is actually a little bit of Java that you have to know. Clearly, there are some, as I call them, sparkisms in the, in the code. I mean, you have to know about flat map, right? which, which may be more or less of uh, something that you know about already. Um, but the lambda functions that you pass in um, are JavaScript. Right? So that function sentence, return sentence, split is a, uh, is a lambda function. What that means is that that is being pushed out to the Spark worker nodes, and they're being executed on those nodes. Okay? So Eclair.js takes care of all of that, handling all of those, uh, those, those functions calls, both in the driver program and also in the, in the Spark worker. OK, so now we've, uh, we've got our, our, our list of words. Uh, now we're going to filter it. Uh, we're going to remove all of them that are really just, you know, they're just white space until we get to this RDD4, where we do map to pair. OK, so here is uh, the place where there's a bit more of a, uh, of a complication, as it were. Um, <clears throat> you'll notice that the, the arguments to map to pair, uh, there are two arguments. There is the lambda function, which is the function word tuple. Um, and we return uh, type tuple, return new tuple. Okay. Um, but we also have this extra argument, which is, a, which is an array uh, of Spark, which has Spark tuple as its uh, sole member. This is an optimization on Eclair.js's part. Um, that Lambda function is executed down on the Spark worker node. Um, and so the, the mechanism at the worker node needs to know um, what, is a, what is a Spark tuple. It's not, clearly, it's not a JavaScript construct. So Eclair.js is the thing that knows what it is, but you have to go tell the worker that, 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 it is, that that's what it is, because we provide a definition for it. Um, now, we could take the entire Eclair.js library and send it every time with every Lambda function to the worker, 
but that, uh, that takes time and network bandwidth and so forth. So there's a slight optimization here where you, you actually specifically pass um, uh, data type Spark data types um, that, are not, that are not general JavaScript data types, but are Spark specific data types that you pass them down uh, for use uh, in, in the Lambda function execution on the workers. Okay, so we've got, uh, we've converted all our words to lowercase, we've put them in tuples, we have the word and we have a count of one, we get a reduce by key, um, and we end up with um, another RDD, which is um, a set of tuples, right, uh, where we have the counts of all the instances of the words. We go to map to pair, um, where we simply reverse the order of the fields. Um, you'll notice again in map to pair, well, this is map to pair again, so we've got to, we have to pass in the tuple argument. We do sort by key, which simply orders the uh, words from the most frequent to the least frequent. And then we get to rdd7.take. So there's an interesting kind of uh, intersection here between Spark and uh, uh, Node.js, which is in Spark, uh, if you remember, there are two types of uh, actions. There are transforms and there are, I'm sorry, there are two types of operators. There are transforms and there are, and there are actions. And transforms simply serve to build that execution plan, that DAG, and, but nothing actually, actually gets executed until you hit uh, an action operator. So take is an action operator. Okay, so that's kind of the Spark story, which many of you would be familiar with. The interesting thing is that in, uh, in Node.js, um, it's all completely asynchronous, right? So actually, if you just ran this without any sort of intelligence in, in the background here, um, that take would simply be an asynchronous call, okay? Um, which may not be quite what you want. You, at this point, you do want the result returned to Node to be executed. Maybe you have some other, you have some other uh, um, code that, that, that depends on it. Um, so in Eclair.js, it, it also mirrors the fact that take is an action, right? So it forces the asynchronous mechanism of JavaScript to return the, the result then. If you're familiar with uh, JavaScript promises, Essentially, what we're doing is we're saying, okay, we're, go we're going to pull in the promise now, return the value, okay? Um, so, you know, in, in general, the, the goal of Eclair.js was to make it simple for the, uh, the JavaScript uh, Node.js programmer just to work in their natural environment, as it were, without having to understand too much, uh, with their without there being sort of odd syntax or odd syntactical constructions in the code, and I, I think we generally succeeded. Um, there are things like they having to pass the, the types out for the Lambda functions, um, and, um, but other things like the, um, the, the notion of promises and the, the transforms versus uh, action operators in Spark is, is hidden from the user. At an architectural level, this is what the Eclair.js stack looks like. Um, so we're, we're working in the browser, um, generally from Node.js, um, whether it's desktop or tablet or a mobile device. Um, and in our Eclair.js environment, we have our Node.js application. And the Eclair.js project is actually split into two. There's a the so-called Eclair.js node, uh, which is responsible for um, referencing and dereferencing variables between what comes back from uh, the, the sort of the Spark end of things, or the Eclair.js Nash horn, which is the, the second component in Eclair.js, um, and making those variables uh, available, or the values are available in the, Node, in the Node.js application. In the sort of the Node.js world, um, when you write an application, if you want to bring in one of those uh, modules, uh, you go to npm, which is what I mentioned before. So you would say npm install module name, right? You would bring in your, your ex say, your express um, environment, which uh, provides a um, web, web server. Um, and you can do exactly the same with Eclair.js. So you, say, you simply say npm install Eclair.js, right? And it then becomes available to your application in that environment. 
Below the Node.js line here, we have the, the, the Spark environment. Um, we make heavy use of the, uh, the Jupyter uh, Notebook Server components and the Jupyter Notebook Server. Um, Dara, the previous speaker, um, showed a slide that uh, I probably should have just have lifted. Uh, he talked about kernels. So the kernels provide a particular language functionality for notebooks. Um, and so between um, Eclair.js, Nashhorn, uh, Tori, which is a kernel that runs with, uh, that, that provides a kernel for uh, the Jupyter Notebook server, we provide um, JavaScript. Um, we provide essentially JavaScript, um, uh, a, a, JavaScript a JavaScript kernel, excuse me, uh, through Tori. Um, Eclair.js Nashhorn is responsible for uh, invoking Nashhorn, which is a component that's available inside of uh, the JVM from Java 1.8 onwards. Uh, and it is, a, it is a component that runs inside the JVM, uh, and its job is to um, execute JavaScript inside the JVM. So unlike, uh, say, with Python, where you go outside of the JVM to an external process, it all happens within the JVM. Okay, so Nashorn, Nashorn really is kind of the, the, the engine that, that gives you that JavaScript to Java capability so that you run everything in bytecode inside the JVM. Um, what Nashorn does, uh, I'm sorry, what Eclair.js Nashorn does is also because Nash, Nashhorn, just the JVM component, it doesn't know anything about Spark, right? It knows about basic Java data types and JavaScript data types, but when you come to something like tuple or label point, right, we have written the wrappers that go around those, um, those data types, and those, that is what forms um, a good part of Eclair.js Nashhorn. Um, you may have also inferred incorrectly from what I just said that um, the, the, so the, 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 the language version of Spark that Eclair.js enables is, is the Java version, right? Because we are going from, um, we're going from Nashhorn into the JVM and we're, it's generating Java bytecode. Okay, so we're actually operating against the, um, the Java API for Spark. That is what is being called in Nashhorn. Um, I said before that the uh, Lambda functions are, are pushed down to the, the workers in the, in the Spark cluster. Um, so we have Nashhorn um, and Eclair.js Nashhorn and Nashhorn at the workers as well. We need that in order to evaluate those. Um, the Lambda functions actually get sent from the driver, um, Spark context running in the, in the, in the driver program they are, they are string serialized and sent down to Nashhorn. Um, and uh, Eclair.js Nashhorn takes care of those, uh, the, the further serialization, deserialization in the, in the worker nodes. So changing gears a bit, the, the, so the primary purpose or the primary focus of Eclair.js really is for the, the web application developer to build um, web applications using JavaScript and, and Node.js. Um, there's a second role that we, we enable with Eclair.js, and that's the, what I'll call the data engineer. I won't really go as far as to say the data scientist, but the data engineer. So this is the person who probably has to build the production application. And if it's a data-driven application that uses analytics or large amounts of data from something like a Spark system, then they need to be able to go look at the data. They need to be able to go and poke at it and uh, you know, see, look at the variables and maybe try out some simple experiments. But they're probably not the data scientist. This is not the person who's doing the basic exploration of the data. So that notebook server uh, piece in the previous architecture diagram, what it also enables is uh, Jupyter notebooks running pure JavaScript. Okay, so it's actually very easy to do that. Um, you just type JavaScript into the cells in the notebook um, and it, it, just, it just works. Um, and again, that's provided by the, the, Nash, the Eclair.js national component and Tori. Um, in sort of traditional notebooks, 
um, you're able to um, have visualizations and formatted text, right? You can evaluate a cell as either code or as, as maybe markup. Um, we haven't gotten that far in Eclair JS. We, we haven't, uh, that's possible to do with Tori. It's actually relatively easy to do with Tori. It's just no one has uh, put the time into uh, to develop those pieces yet. Um, so, um, so that so the Clear JS provides that JavaScript kernel, so the data, so the data engineers and the web developers can right, can use code and also work in notebooks. Um, and here's an example. Actually, this is the Movie Lens uh, recommender system. Uh, so this is a fairly well-known uh, example. Uh, it it exists in its original form in Python. Um, and it's a way of using the ALS um, machine learning algorithm or statistical algorithm um, to make uh, movie recommendations based on uh, what movies you've seen, what movies you liked, and it will then go forward and recommend uh, what other movies you liked, might like to see. And so we took the uh, uh, we d we took the movie lens example in Python and fairly simply translated it into uh, JavaScript. And this is just a snapshot of that JavaScript of that applicate of that uh, example, the movie lens recommendation um, experiment running in in a, in a notebook. So to wrap up, um, so Eclair JS is primarily for the web developer uh, working in Node.js and JavaScript. It's also for data engineers who can use uh, JavaScript in the same way in notebooks. The project is relatively new. It's been uh, started at the end of last year, so it's uh, six, eight months old. Um, it's in GitHub. You can go to eclairjs.org. It'll uh, land you on a, on, a, on a page, which will give you a brief overview of eclairjs, and it'll point you to those two projects, the eclairjs node and eclairjs nashorn. Um, the current state of the project is we've implemented most of the Spark version 1.6 API. Um, we're really interested in 2.0. Uh, that uh, scenario I, I mentioned in, with the, uh, the application where we do for each RDD and then we query it, having the structured uh, query ability on streams would just be, would, would make that uh, a lot more easy and I hope a lot more stable because um, speaking um, or from experience, it's, it's not the easiest thing to get right. Um, so at the, uh, at the GitHub site, there's lots of examples, there's documentation, it's getting started, there's Docker images, there's actually a version of this running up. Um, there's a Docker image running up on uh, IBM's cloud and IBM Bluemix. Um, so you can just run a, like a little baby, um, like Spark cluster with a ClairJS uh, running in it. Um, it's open source. It, uh, I do work for IBM. Um, it was the project was started by IBM, um, and most of the work so far has been done by IBMers. But it is uh, Apache version two licensed, um, and we do have uh, we're starting to have people from outside of IBM who are starting to work on the project. We're, we're starting to gain interest here, and uh, so we're always looking for more people to come join the project and, and collaborate with us. Thank you very much. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, you're at the IBM booth, right, I'm saying? Uh, or I'll, I'll stay yeah, here for Yeah, David can actually stay for any questions, but we also have the attendee reception, so by all means. <laughs> right. Thanks very much, everybody.